from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Today. Prepping for USCA's newest forecast. Watching as Hurricane Florence approaches, East Coast farmers are bracing for impact. Storm surge right along the coast, a significant life-threatening storm surge associated with this hurricane. In agribusiness, seasonal price patterns. 14 out of the 15, last 15 years, uh, you sell beans uh, middle of September, buy them back uh, first part of October, it's a winner. And meet a Missouri cattleman spending less time on the farm and more time in the state house. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting, full size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Later today, USDA releases fresh supply demand numbers. Analysts are watching to see if they still expect a record large soybean crop. USDA releasing its crop production and Wadsworth reports at midday. Some analysts anticipating U.S. corn yields to decline slightly with guesses around 177 bushels per acre. That would be down one bushel from last month. On the soybean side, the trade anticipating bean yields to rise in at nearly 52 bushels to the acre. That's a bushel higher than a month ago. However, carryout numbers, they may hold the market sway. Expected to be stark differences between the two crops, including what could be a record number of U.S. soybeans in storage. You know, when you look at U.S. corn and world corn in the balance sheets, we're looking at a 20% year-over-year drawdown on both of those balance sheets, the, the U.S. and the global corn situation. When you look at the beans, it's the opposite. We're going to nearly double our, our U.S. bean carryout in one year if these projections are near reality, and we're going to see a, a good 10% increase in the uh, global carryout in beans if the numbers are correct. Crop scouts on the Pro Farmer Midwest Crop Tour in late August say Midwestern soybeans look good which is making them nervous about price. My concern is this price of beans. It's if it's going to go down more. I think I think we've got really good weather here that for this fall, you know, other than the frost, nobody said that word this year yet, but other than a frost, that's the only thing that can slow down these beans. Also in the report, an update on global wheat stocks, multiple locations around the world dealing with adverse weather issues during this growing season. One of those places is Australia, where parts of the country have been wrapped in drought. A new wheat production forecast puts the Aussie wheat crop at a 10-year low, the country cutting its forecast by about 13%. Australian ag economists say wheat production for the 18-19 season is 12.1 million tons, down from the June forecast of 21.9 million tons. Um, I think the trade will be interested in any adjustment to the global production situation. We've seen a lot of major producers cut uh, production recently, so we'll see what USDA does with that. Uh, the wheat balance sheets uh, globally at least tightening up a little bit year over year. Meanwhile, USDA rolling out its latest crop progress report a day late. The Ag Department citing a technical issue as the cause of the delay. According to the latest numbers, wheat harvest is wrapping up across the northern plains. 93% of the spring wheat crop is now cut. That's eight points ahead of average. And on the winter wheat side, 5% of the new crop is now planted. USA releasing its first look at the national corn harvest. So far, just 5% of the nation's corn crop has been shelled. That's a couple of points ahead of average. Texas, Kentucky, and North Carolina lead the way, with Carolina farmers rushing to get the crop out before Hurricane Florence comes ashore. In soybean fields, 31% of the crops now dropping leaves. That's 12 points ahead of average. Louisiana, North Dakota lead the way in crop maturity. For the North Dakota crop, it's 16 points ahead of the five-year average. Farmers are rushing harvest and working to protect livestock as Hurricane Florence continues to gain strength in the Atlantic. North Carolina residents are stocking up on supplies and preparing for what could be a Category 4, possibly even 5 hurricane with winds stopping 130 miles per hour. Weather officials say Florence is so wide that life-threatening storm surge is forecast to push 300 miles ahead of the eye. And once ashore, swirling clouds could drop 20 to 30 inches of rain in South Carolina to Ohio and Pennsylvania. The latest data says there's a chance that storm could slow and stall once it reaches land. The several coastal states now evacuating. Those that stay say they're getting prepared. 
So storm surge, flash flooding, um, heavy rainfall, and of course the winds associated with this. A lot of trees down, a lot of power outages. So we're really trying to get everyone to, to be ready for this system and looking at the onset of tropical storm force winds. Everybody along the coastline needs to be have all their plans in place and be done by Wednesday. And look at this, the chance of tropical storm force winds extending well inland. Everybody needs to have their plans in place by Thursday. North Carolina hog farmers are making final preparations to protect their livestock before Hurricane Florence arrives. Producers managing lagoons, preparing for power outages, and moving hogs out of barns and flood-prone areas to higher ground. Since the Category 4 storm is slated to dump up to 15 or 20 inches of rain in pockets of North Carolina, the president of the North Carolina Pork Council, Brandon Warren, saying, quote, we are continuing to work until the storm will force us inside, end quote. A little bit of history on these size hurricanes. According to the National Weather Service, landfalling Category 4 hurricanes are rare in the mainland U.S. There have been just 24 since 1851. Category 5 landfalls, even more rare, just three on record. And all but three of these big storms hit south of South Carolina, making Florence both rare and unique. The National Pork Producers Council intending to gather in Washington today to lobby for issues important to the industry. MPBC planning to focus on trade, prices, and the need for funding for a foot and mouth disease vaccine bank. If we today was to get a foot and mouth disease outbreak, uh, it would cost over a 10 year period $200 billion. Uh, $128 billion would come into the animal livestock industry. That would include uh, just beef and pork. Uh, it would also affect corn and soybean farmers because the loss of the use of corn and soybeans into the livestock production. MPPC is asking Congress to establish mandatory funding for a foot and mouth disease vaccine bank through the life of the farm bill. Now, African swine fever is also creeping up on its radar of top issues. On the future of protein, USDA and the FDA are planning a joint public meeting to discuss the use of cultured cell technology to develop products derived from livestock and poultry. Now it's scheduled for October 23rd and 24th. USDA says the meeting will focus on the potential hazards, oversight considerations, and labeling of cell cultured food products derived from livestock and poultry. Now the first day of the meeting is gonna focus on the safe production of these cultured food products and the oversight required. The second day will focus on labeling considerations. Mike Hoffman joining us again this morning for today's Crop Comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Kyle Wendland is cutting silage in northeastern Iowa. He began during late August, but battled mud and rain. Kyle thinks farmers should make good progress this week, though. Our next picture comes from Luke Says in Vic, Louisiana. He says irrigated soybeans are excellent in his area. Luke says the other crops vary. Cotton looks good, but is deteriorating rapidly from wet weather. He says 10 to 15 bushels per acre lower than normal. Now take a look at your wind speed forecast. It's going to be a bit windy this morning, northern and central plains. It will become windier though as we head through the afternoon and also out west, as you can see there from Wyoming all the way down to parts of California. Then besides the breeze and parts of the plains in the west, we'll start to look in the southeast where obviously Florence will be coming toward land as we head through the day tomorrow and it will be getting very windy parts of the Carolinas. We'll have your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on machinerypeat.com. What should we expect markets to do this time of year? Well, we'll talk about it next at the Agribusiness Desk. And later, this hardworking cattleman has a day job with big responsibilities. We'll meet Missouri's news governor today in the country. Ag Day, brought to you by Prosaro Fungicide from Bayer. In agribusiness, it was a mixed day for the markets. Tuesday, as traders prepare for a hurricane strike and another big report from USDA, let's get details now from our friends on the floor. Talk a little bit about the soybean market today. Just feel like it just does not feel like we fully priced in the bearish factors going on in the market today. Number one factor, if the average yield estimate comes in for the report tomorrow, ending stocks come in at a record high, 846 million bushels. That's up 96.7% from a year ago. That's up 180% from two years ago. Uh, the market looking at uh, cash levels, 
Central Illinois basis is trading at 30 cents under the board. Typically at this time of the year, well, the five-year average is uh, that the Central Illinois cash will be trading a $1.20 premium. Thank you. This is Terry Rogensack coming to you from the CME Group trading floor. Jeff French, Top 30 Ad Marketing, our guest here at the Agribusiness Test today. Jeff, as we look at uh, the, the seasonal tendencies, uh, right now obviously we're, we're stepping into harvest season. What about on the trade side of the ledger? Are there any plays here right now? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a big play and it's in the November contract on the soybeans. 14 out of the 15, last 15 years, uh, you sell beans uh, middle of September, buy them back uh, first part of October it's a winner. And you know, this year it coincides with, you know, the start of the USDA report, potentially seeing record yields out there. Sure. Uh, a record carry out, obviously, because of the tariffs in place on China. But um, we could see lower prices here, but it's one thing that everybody knows about it. Mm -hmm. You know, the market knows about it. So we'll just see if it actually happens yeah. again here this year. What, what tends to be behind that push and, and the reason why we go from a low to a high in that in that space? Well, I think it's, you know, the ramp up to harvest okay. right now, this time period. And, and the market is trying to search for a bottom and look for demand. The problem is everybody is kind of on the sidelines, not knowing really what's going to happen here on the trade front. Yeah. You know, if something tra changes there, uh, you're going to see plenty of people come back in on the buy side and we're going to have much higher prices. How much weight is the the news we're getting and the, and the things that we, reports we're hearing about the size of the yields here uh, for soybeans? Because they, they seem to be rather large. Yeah, they do. But, the, you know, the private forecast that we've seen, you know, it's not showing new lows yet. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you have a reluctance of some speculators selling it down here because, you know, we're just a tweet away of, you know, the market being sharply higher. Sure. So uh, we'll see. We've held the lows here acting pretty good. But I think if the USDA confirms, you know, another bushel, bushel and a half increase, um, we could see prices move lower. Okay. Well, we'll see something to watch. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Back with more Agri. Just a minute. For a special report on the grain markets, call toll-free at 877-TT-HEDGE. That's 877-884-3343. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Welcome back to Ag Day. Your meteorologist Mike Hoffman and Mike, all eyes are on Florence watching to see what this is going to do. This could be a really big storm. It, it could be major in two ways, the wind and the waves as it comes on shore and then the rain afterwards sure. inland. And so those are the two really big issues. But it's still more than 24 hours before we even begin to see the effects of Florence onto the Carolinas. It, the clouds are coming in, but uh, the actual effects. Still watching this area of low pressure in the Gulf, that still has a chance before it comes into the Texas coast of becoming a tropical storm. Obviously, that is not nearly as strong as a category three or four hurricane like Florence will be. High pressure, though, dominating and stalled out from the Great Lakes, Central Plains, back into the Southwest. We have two uh, stationary fronts, and basically everything is just, it's like a big traffic jam in the eastern part of the country. As Florence comes westward, everything else is coming to a halt. That's why we're, uh, we're sitting here with very nice weather in some areas and not so nice in others. Another storm system coming into the Pacific Northwest kind of being shunted northward, as you'll see over the next uh, couple of days. And putting the maps into motion, we'll ha head through the uh, afternoon or the morning hours tomorrow. And Florence obviously is starting to approach the coast at 7 a.m. It's still a little, little ways offshore and it's slowing down. Most computer models are uh, causing it to uh, slow down. And it's still on our model showing very close to the coast by late in the day today. It might even be tonight or uh, tomorrow night before things actually uh, do start to come inland, the actual eye of Florence. So precipitation estimate past 24 hours, hit and miss in the east, fair amount. Uh, Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast area, not too much around the rest of the country. Adding in the next 36 hours, we'll add some more in uh, parts of southeast Texas, Louisiana, southern Mississippi. 
a little bit more uh, up in the uh, DC and New York City area. And then we just start to see the effects of Florence by the end of the day tomorrow. Now taking a look at uh, high temperatures, very comfortable. Great Lakes Northeast, lots of 70s. Uh, comfortably warm, I would call it. Uh, most of the plain states into the southeast. Obviously a little bit muggier in the southeast where lows tonight will stay in the 70s. But we're seeing lots of uh, 50s and 60s across most of the uh, Great Lakes and the Corn Belt. High temperatures tomorrow afternoon. It uh, heats up a little bit. There will be a few 90s, so muggy conditions uh, showing up in the southern Mississippi Valley. There's the jet stream. I want you to watch this little uh, feature right there. That's, that's kind of uh, Florence. And you'll notice what happens as we put this map into motion. It comes in and it kind of sits there, kind of moves south for a while, kind of comes north, gets picked up by the main jet stream eventually. That's Wednesday. It's still on the weather map. Something we're going to have to watch for a, for a while, the way it looks. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. We head to Walla Walla, Washington. First of all, partly sunny and pleasant, high of 71. Wichita Falls, Texas, humid. Couple of showers around, high of 84. And Evansville, Indiana, a mixture of sunshine and clouds, high of comfortable 80 degrees. We'll check on the trade impacts to America's produce growers next on the Packer TV and later we're off to Missouri where each weekend the state's newest governor trades his suit and tie for time on the family farm. On the Packer TV, according to a new study from Rabobank, U.S. mandarin, walnut, grape, cherry and peach exports will be the hardest hit by Chinese retaliatory tariffs. The study estimating sales of U.S. fruits and nuts to China for the year ending July 2019 will range from just over 5% down for almonds to 25 to 30% lower for grapes and cherries. However, that same study reports that the total demand for most U.S. fruit and nuts will increase over the next year. Analysts say increasing Chinese demand should partially offset the effects of those tariffs. Also from the Packer, despite retaliatory tariffs in key markets, U.S. fresh apple exports have performed well so far this year. U.S. apple exports from January through July are up 21% in value, 19% in volume compared to a year ago. According to the latest trade data, exports to China were down nearly 20% in January through July period compared to last year. China imposing those retaliatory tariffs of about 50% on U.S. apples earlier this year in response to U.S. tariffs on Chinese steel, aluminum, and other goods. Look past the jeans and work truck, you'll find Missouri's newest governor. His story is next. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota's M7060, built to get the job done. See KubotaUSA.com or your local Kubota dealer for more information. It's no secret the number of politicians who come from real working farms continues to shrink. In Missouri, new Governor Mike Parson just cleared his first 100 days in office, and in that time, he's dealt with a drought, a tragedy in Branton, and the upheaval from Eric Greitens' resignation. Paul Adler with Ag Day affiliate KY3 reports that on top of it all, he's back to his local farm nearly every weekend. You know, really just going to check some cows. I got cows calving right now. If you picture Missouri's governor in a suit each weekend, that isn't this governor. He's working, surveying his Polk County farm. Baby calf can get some sort of disease or some sort of infection. Things can go downhill pretty quick. Parson watches over 100 head of cattle, and in the past 100 days, the state of Missouri too. Farmers will now be able to pump water. While we met on a drizzly day, a drought dried up corn, streams, and ponds this summer and it grabbed his attention. And the creation of a lottery for hay on state property. Parson rounded up state agencies to help farmers. I think we did as much as we could do. Then he did what he could at home. I fed hay for the first time in August and I, I've never fed hay in August before. And so it's disheartening as a farmer when you have gotta do things like that. Job one before the drought, changing the tone from the top. Former Governor Eric Greitens often punched up his words with the fighter's language. It was, it was really important to me. It was important to my administration. Uh, we, I think it was more of a thing that we just need to reassure the people of Missouri they, that things are going to be okay here. Parson learned he'd be Missouri's 57th governor right here on this farm. Less than two years ago, that didn't even seem like a remote possibility. They, they saved my life, and that's uh, I'll always be grateful for that. Parson rolled into surgery at Cox South on December 24th, 2016, open heart surgery. As rolling down that hallway, I thought, you know what? You know, I've been given an opportunity to live a pretty good life, and I've lived it. And if, I, if it tomorrow's to be, 
that, that I'm gonna do a better job than what I did before. Staying dry. Parson says he feels better than ever now. He's happy visiting with neighbors, including the boy who gives him updates on his cows. I think you're the black and white one. So don't look for a presidential run someday. When he's done serving as governor, he'll be back in the Ozarks on Parson Farm. No, I'm coming home. You know, I want to come home. I want to spend some time with my family. Uh, you know, and I hope at the end of that career, people's going to say, you know what? You know, Mike Parson did a pretty good job. Parson tells KY3 he'll make a decision about running for another term as governor in about a year. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us from all of us here at Agdam, Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.